Hello everyone. Welcome to the third video talking about monopolistic competition. This will be the final video before the practice quiz video on this topic. And the whole purpose of this video is diving into one key aspect that is quite unique to monopolistic competition, monopolistically competitive firms, and that is advertising. So I started um, this section of the lecture notes with two main questions that I want you to think about. So, so far we have studied three different market structures, perfect competition, monopoly, and now monopolistic competition. In each of these, would you expect to see firms spending money to advertise their products? Why or why not? So in each of these, would you expect to see firms spending money to advertise their products? Why or why not? And the second question I'm asking is, is advertising good or bad from society's viewpoint? Try to think of at least one pro and one con. So I guess, you know, you would guess from the first question that because this advertising video is in the monopolistic competition section that we would expect to see firms in monopolistically competitive market structures be the ones advertising their products. And this is the case. So in the, you know, monopolistic competitive market structure, there exists this incentive for firms to advertise their products. And the reason for that is quite simple. So we know that in perfect competition, all of the firms, even though there are a lot of different firms, they're all selling the exact same thing. There is no difference in the product that these firms in perfect competition are selling. So because they're all selling the exact identical product with no differences between the products, there's really no need for those firms to advertise. You know what type of product you're going to get, and it doesn't really matter from which firm you buy that product from. For a monopoly on the other side of the spectrum, they're the only ones that are selling a certain type of good. So if you can't buy that good from anywhere else, from any other business, then there's really no point for the monopoly to advertise either, right? The monopoly is going to be the only one you can buy from, so they don't really need to advertise their product that much to the public. But when firms are selling slightly differentiated products, and are charging a price that's above marginal cost, there's this incentive to advertise to attract more buyers in this monopolistically competitive market structure. And, you know, just some quick facts about advertising, um, particularly in the United States, in highly differentiated goods throughout the United States, you know, 10 to 20% of a firm's revenue that they bring in is usually spent on advertising videos. So whether this be, you know, commercials, promotions, they send out coupons in the mail, whatever, you know, 10 to 20%, that's almost, you know, a fifth of the revenue that these firms in monopolistically competitive markets bring in they're spending right back out on advertising to try to bring in more customers, trying to tell the customers how great their, you know, slight difference of the product is compared to other firms that may be selling a similar thing, but they're slightly different. So again, with, you know, industrial type products, there's hardly any advertising and then homogeneous products, like with perfect competition, there's no advertising at all because there's no need to advertise. 
So again, in monopolistically competitive industries, product differentiation and market pricing lead naturally to the use of advertising. And the more differentiated the products are, the more advertising the firms will buy. Again, to attract more customers, to kind of differentiate their brand or you know, the product that they're selling even more than their competitors. And there is some disagreement about the social value of advertising in general from an economist's perspective. So if you ask a marketing person about how they feel concerning advertising, you may get a very different answer than if you ask an economist about how they feel about advertising. So I'm gonna go through some of the pros and the cons of advertising from an economist's point of view here. So I'm gonna start with the negatives. I'm gonna give you a critique of advertising from an economist's point of view. And kind of, you know, the negative pessimistic view of advertising is that firms can use advertising to almost manipulate people's tastes. That the commercials that different businesses show, you know, the claims that these firms make about how great their product is compared to other brands of a similar product, it could be all just a psychological manipulation rather than actually, you know, giving valuable information about the quality of their product. They can just be saying, our product is the greatest and you should always buy from us and never buy from anyone else. Well, how accurate, how true is that? It could just be, you know, this manipulation tool that firms are using to attract more people to buy their certain brand of a product. So again, if firms are using advertising not to inform the customer, but to manipulate the customer, this could, you know, create a desire for a certain brand that otherwise might not exist or create a certain hype around a product that otherwise wouldn't have much hype around it to begin with. And if we think of advertising having this kind of manipulation effect on people rather than informing the customer about the type of product that they're selling, you know, this could lead to an increased perception of product differentiation. This could really enforce the idea that, oh man, Nike and Adidas, even though they're selling shoes and the shoes arguably are quite similar, if Nike is pumping out ads saying our shoes are so much better, Nike, you know, contributes to all these charitable causes, Nike does this, Nike does that, you should always buy from Nike, then it may, I guess, manipulate consumers to think that, oh wow, maybe Nike shoes are really different and they are really better than Adidas shoes, even though they probably were made in very similar factories in the same part of the world. So again, with advertising, creating this, I don't know, perception of product differentiation that's even more extreme than what actually exists, this could really, you know, foster this brand loyalty among people there. You may know certain people that only buy from certain companies, they only buy a certain brand of car, they only buy a certain brand of shoes, they only buy certain brands of makeup, whatever, certain brands of clothes, et cetera, et cetera. So based on, you know, advertising that may tell people that, yeah, it's okay if you only buy from us because we're the best, even though it may not be all that informative, 
this could lead to even higher markups in the price for the people that buy from them. So advertising, if it's used to manipulate people's tastes, it could reinforce this idea of product differentiation and allow these firms to act more towards the monopoly side of the spectrum versus the more perfectly competitive side of the spectrum. What I mean by this is a monopolistically competitive firm, if it you know, gets this brand loyalty surrounding it, it knows for a fact that these people will always buy from us so we can charge them a higher price. We can act more like a monopoly versus if people didn't really have a brand loyalty associated with certain types of products, then it would be more like perfect competition, right? So this is, you know, the major critique that economists usually have about advertising is that it moves us farther away from perfect competition. It moves us farther away from lower prices, higher quantities, maximized total surplus. If advertising was used to manipulate people's tastes. But there could also be a positive side to advertising as well. Um, and the key difference here between these pros and cons is really the purpose for which the advertising is used. So we talked about, you know, firms using advertising to manipulate. This is usually a bad thing. But if firms are actually, you know, using this advertising to tell buyers important information about their product to really inform buyers about all the things that make their product different and not trying to manipulate people. You know, informed buyers can easily find and exploit price differences if this is the case. People are able to shop around and say, oh, you know, there really is a difference between these two products and I'm going to buy from this brand, which gives the incentive for other brands that are selling similar goods to maybe up their quality a little bit. So if advertising is used to, you know, provide useful information that allows buyers to make more informed decisions, this could, you know, actually promote competition among these monopolistically competitive firms and kind of reduces the market power that any one firm holds in this market. So, um, and this was kind of shown in this uh, prominent study in uh, the Journal of Law and Economics, even though it was from 1972, it's still kind of relevant in its findings. And um, this author Benham found that eyeglasses were more expensive in states that prohibited advertising by eyeglass makers than in states that did not restrict such advertising. So in states that didn't allow any commercials or advertising about certain eyeglass brands, those states were having eyeglasses be more expensive than in other states that allowed eyeglass companies to advertise their brand, promote their brand. In those states where advertising was legal, eyeglasses were less expensive. And from this finding, we can kind of conclude that, you know, in states that didn't allow advertising, people probably weren't getting all of the information necessary for them to make informed purchases. So maybe they just bought the same brand that they always did or their family always did and didn't really know about other brands all that much. But in states that allowed firms to advertise and explain their brand and how their brand is different and better than everyone else, it made those firms actually more competitive and compete with one another, which drove the prices 
of eyeglasses down. So to kind of summarize what I've been talking about, um, in monopolistic competition, because these firms are selling differentiated products, there is this incentive for firms to advertise. And whether or not, you know, economists think that advertising is a good thing or a bad thing really just depends on the context in which the advertising is done. If advertising is used to kind of promote useful information and not try to manipulate people, then economists generally agree that advertising could be a good thing because it leads to more competition. But if advertising is used in a psychological way rather than an informational way, then this could actually make these firms less competitive because it develops these kind of brand loyalties among people. So brand names, we've already talked about that a little bit. So with this um, brand name stuff, this will be the final point of this video. In many markets, brand name products um, coexist with generic ones. So you could get, you know, brand name macaroni and cheese, or you could get Walmart brand macaroni and cheese. And usually the brand name is sold for a higher price than the generic brand. So, and, you know, because of this, brand names are spending more on advertising to charge this higher price than the generic substitutes. And again, as with advertising, like we just talked about, there's a disagreement about the economics associated with brand names. So again, there are pros and cons associated with brand names when you ask an economist how they feel about having brand name stuff versus generic stuff. Usually the critics of the brand name stuff um, kind of fall under the same arguments as the critics of advertising. The brand name is just something there and it doesn't really make the product any different than the generic brand product. So from this perspective, someone could argue that, you know, name brand, name brand Kraft macaroni and cheese is exactly the same as Walmart brand macaroni and cheese, great value macaroni and cheese, but people are going to spend more money for the Kraft name on the box. And from certain economists' point of view, this is very, you know, irrational. But again, some people could argue the flip side of that in that the brand name Kraft sends some kind of informational signal to consumers that say, hey, maybe Kraft brand macaroni and cheese actually is better than great value macaroni and cheese. And, you know, there is this incentive for these brand names to maintain this high quality signal that they've been sending about their brand. So because that brand name is on that box, Kraft has an incentive to put out a better product and not disappoint their customers. So this could lead to, you know, better products in the long run. So this basically covers all of the information that I wanted you guys to learn about monopolistic competition. Um, in the next video, um, you'll be going through the practice quiz that I made up for monopolistic competition. And it's gonna be, you know, very similar to the monopoly practice quiz video. I'll give you guys some questions about the videos we've watched so far and give you the answers uh, to those questions once you have taken the time to try to answer them yourself.